Okay. Well, I think you can hear me. Great. Welcome, everybody. Good morning, uh, and, and welcome to today's event. My name is Carl Meacham, and I am the director here uh, of the Americas program here at CSIS. And uh, we're truly lucky today to have <coughs> His Excellency Jose Miguel Insulza, the Secretary General of the OAS. I, I believe the Secretary General will probably touch on uh, many issues today, uh, but I think the focus of today uh, was to be uh, the crisis in Venezuela. Uh, so I'll let him, I'll let him focus on that in, in, in his remarks. I'm just going to frame the discussion a little bit uh, and um, just give a little bit of a, uh, of a background for the folks that are watching <coughs> uh, of, uh, of what's going on uh, with Venezuela. It is, of course, difficult to pinpoint uh, the beginning of the uh, current Venezuelan crisis um, I think that uh, the current uh, unrest can probably be traced, uh, most specifically this last episode can be traced to about one month ago. In early February, students began protesting in Venezuela's major cities. Since then, the protests have spread in size and in scope, demanding everything from reduced uh, corruption to the resignation of President Maduro and daily violent clashes between opposition and government supporters have come to characterize these demonstrations. To date, 18 have been confirmed dead, over 260 injured, and more than 1,000 detained or arrested, according to official figures. And reports of media censorship and human rights violations have only grown as the protests have continued. The crisis has raised a lot of important questions, but perhaps two of the most important ones uh, are or the most important one, I think, in my view, is what's at stake in the crisis for Venezuela, for the U.S., and for the region? And I guess a follow-up would be uh, how individual states and the international community might help to mediate the situation which, uh, by most accounts, has spiraled out of control. Uh, the stakes in Venezuela are, to put it simply, huge. The crisis hasn't garnered as much attention as the one in Ukraine, and understandably, given the scope of what's happening in Eastern Europe and the global implications involved, uh, you can make a case uh, for uh, Ukraine uh, being, uh, being more important. But the same way that the crisis in Ukraine is key for Eastern European stability, Venezuela is similarly pivotal for stability in the Western Hemisphere. The Venezuelan crisis highlights a challenge to the democratic norms and rights that we cherish, uh, not just in the United States, but in the region. Uh, the country is the fourth largest supplier of oil to the United States, uh, and uh, petro-driven Venezuela props up uh, the uh, governments of many countries with the uh, uh, oil and gas assistance program, uh, and there's the other issue, which is uh, Venezuela borders with Colombia, and its uh, uh, relationships with uh, Colombia, not just commercial, but also issues relating to the transnational drug issue are also at play or, uh, in this discussion if the situation in Venezuela gets worse and worse. So, uh, the, the, this, uh, the, the Venezuela issue has larger regional implications, and it's, and it's very clear. Uh, chaos then in Venezuela could translate into chaos in the region. So uh, what are the potential ways forward in Venezuela? Uh, I will, for obvious reasons, leave much of that question to uh, the Secretary General. Uh, there are, in reality, a fairly wide variety of options. The crisis, of course, could be resolved internally. Uh, whether that be through some degree of political change or easing or through the current government's reestablishment of order. Uh, on the international level, we could see the involvement of individual actors or multilateral groups. Uh, some are skeptical that this will occur uh, domestically. Some are looking for a larger organization uh, to help mediate the situation. And the natural uh, actor here is the OAS. Uh, citing the organization's democratic charter and the president, precedent that uh, the OAS has set in the past in its involvement in other uh, conflicts uh, around the region. Um, but greater involvement is far from clear cut, given the organization's consensus driven model and the several members that would see its involvement as an overreach. Um, many have called. Uh, 
other organizations, the UN, even the Vatican, uh, to get involved. These are issues that I think we'll be able to dis discuss here uh, today. Uh, it's not that we can say that the OAS hasn't done uh, that much either in the, uh, with regards to Venezuela. A lot of people would say they should be doing more. I believe that a meeting has been scheduled on Thursday uh, to discuss this issue. So even if movement is slow, some movement is occurring. Uh, and I don't want to sort of characterize this for the Secretary. I think the Secretary is going to characterize it himself. Um, on that note, I, I want to turn it to the Secretary. Um, but I do want to just say a couple of, of, of background uh, points about the Secretary. A lot of you know uh, the Secretary as uh, Secretary General of the OAS. Uh, I've had the privilege of knowing uh, the Secretary's long history because I'm part Chilean and his uh, profile and his involvement in Chile uh, at a very sensitive period uh, was very important. Uh, prior to his position at the OAS, he served as uh, Under Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Secretary General of the Presidency, Minister of the Interior, Vice President of Chile. That tells you sort of the weight of the person that's here to my right. Um, so with that kind of profile, a lot is, is expected of you. <laughs> And, and dealing with issues like Venezuela, um, I think that you probably have answers and options to, to, uh, to uh, deal with that situation going forward. So the usual uh, rules apply today. Uh, when we go into the Q&A session, uh, I, please identify who you are and uh, try to keep it brief. I know there's a lot of folks with a lot of opinions and with a lot of questions for the secretary. Uh, I want to be able to get to as many folks as we can. Uh, Having said that, once again, welcome to all of you. Secretary General, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Bien. Sí. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I don't know if, uh, if this is working. Yes, it's working. Uh, well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Carl, for this invitation. I think I could start by saying that uh, we should have had this meeting about uh, a couple of weeks ago. Mm. That's when we said it first. I will not talk about the reasons why it was postponed, but actually it was postponed twice because we had meetings at the OAS that didn't take place. And in the meantime, several things happened. And the situation today is, I would say, much more serious than it was two weeks ago. Uh, many, many more things have happened, many more marches and mobilizations from uh, uh, students and uh, women and uh, groups uh, who favor the opposition, groups who favor the government. More people have died. Unfortunately, more people have died. I think that when we started talking about this, there may have been a, two, 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 two or three persons that were dead. And now we're talking about uh, over a dozen, and that's a, that's a fact. Uh, the, Public opinion has been very much divided in several countries. A lot of members of, of people from the, from the, the, the different uh, uh, organizations, so I would say moral forces in the world, like the Pope and others, have given their, their opinion on that. And unfortunately, I would also say the OAS has not met. And it has not met because it, the Council has not been called to, to, to session in spite of the request of the, for the ambassador of Panama. And uh, that is the uh, first one ever. I didn't know that. I, I've never, I never seen the OAS not meeting in 10 days after the an ambassador request an urgent. Uh, I, I, I request, some, request something that the council has to meet to, to decide. I do hope that we have that meeting tomorrow. I do hope it's an open meeting, even though some say it's going to be a private meeting. And I hope that uh, people will react to that. Or our government will react to that, but uh, that's, that's, that's the way things stand. By the way, the council is called by the president of the council. The secretary general is not, is not empowered to call the council into session. Now, I think that we can agree on some, just since I, I, I feel that in the questions there will be some disagreement, I will start by saying what are the things we agree on matters of Venezuela. Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. I think that this microphone is not. Maybe maybe we have put it like this. I mean, I hold it like this. Uh, I think it's uh, that's it. Uh, this is the 
the microphone they gave me. So. <laughs> I, 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 well, I can, I can speak as loud as I can. And maybe, maybe without the microphone either, because I don't think that it's... Oh, no. I will use the microphone very well. Okay, I will use the microphone. I was saying that I think that there are some things, some objective things, I will say, in which we can agree on Venezuela. I, I, right here? Okay, okay. We can agree on Venezuela. No, no, que no me lo voy a poner la corbata porque no va a funcionar. We're going to get you out of the house. Ahí, okay, ahí. Okay, okay. Ahí me escuchan. Can you listen to me in here? Yeah. Very well. Uh, I would say that we can agree on some things. I mean, and uh, I, I hope that uh, these matters, which uh, are not, not, not to be contested by anyway, anyone, just to begin with. First, Venezuela is undergoing a very large division, a very large divide among its people. Uh, if you look at the streets where I, I said this yesterday to somebody from the government and the opposition, and they both answered the same. They said, I said, there are marches on both sides, very large, and both say, said, we are, ours are larger. I don't know which are larger, but there is a big division in society, and that's a fact. This is not your common situation in which uh, some very strong armed forces or something fights against a large number of people, or vice versa. Some very small groups are repressed by a large society. Now, this is a divided society in the first place. Second, there are some very serious, objective, serious problems, economic and social problems in Venezuela, that have to be dealt soon. If you look at the situation, of course, we, we all know some of the things that are going on, uh, the inflation, the shortage of products, the decay in the in, in industrial production, and basically in the production, in the oil production, the prices of oil, which are practically free for Venezuelans, in spite of I mean, in spite of the one hundred dollars a barrel that they are for every for every other part in the world, the lack of uh, of uh, several services at this moment, difficulties in in all kinds of supplies, etc. Everybody knows that that's going on. And they are problems that can only be dealt when the country is in peace. So something that the, the conclusion of this, uh, is this is as, while this crisis, crisis lasts, the real problems are not going to be addressed. And they are serious problems. If everybody went home today and nobody ever protested or supported the government anymore, the, those problems will still exist. And they are not easy to deal with. Third, I think that's something that we can all agree also, even though to some people it may be a novelty, but it's not, a, it's not, not new, but now everybody agrees on that, is that there's a real, strong, and mobilized opposition. Uh, I will quote something Pamela showed me this morning, which is a piece by Enrique Krause from some time ago, not from yesterday. Or, a year ago, uh, well, yeah, a year ago, he would have asked if uh, if uh, if there would be action by the opposition now that President Ch with the passing of President Chavez, who's passing, by the way, uh, is uh, one was exactly one, where, uh, on the fifth of March of, of last year, and the crowd would respond, no, I think that there will be a continuity of the regime, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but I very much trust the students, you said. I think that the students can do something. And really, this was started by the students. But this is not just the students. It's a full-blown opposition, which is very strong, very diverse in many of the things that they ask for. Some of them are even going to a dialogue called by President Maduro, saying that they are opposition. Others, are, another one, which is Leopoldo Lopez, has inaugurated yesterday, a, a, I don't know if it's a blog or a, a, a Twitter, called uh, the La Salida or something like that, meaning that this is, this is only for people, for people who want to, the government to leave. Uh, so, but they're but very really strong in protesting and in asking for, a, for, a, for, a, for a, a full change in the country. That's a very clear point. That's, a, that's also I think, something we can agree. Uh, I think we can agree also in, in some of the responses 
the answer, I mean, of course, uh, we, everybody has rejected the violations of human rights and the violence and the deaths that have occurred and uh, feel that this should be investigated. While some people, though some people don't, uh, uh, I would say, trust the internal investigations, certainly I think we all agree that the Commission on Human Rights should go into the matter and look into all these cases of, uh, of, of deaths and they should be nasty in, 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 uh, uh, investigated and punished. Now, uh, in spite of that, uh, there are some disagreements. And one disagreement has to do with the majors, with the most important thing in this, in this case, which is from my point of view, of course, one says that these ideas are the most important, probably. But in my case, it's supported by the Pope, by the Secretary General of the United Nations, by the head of the European Union, by the heads of everybody. He says, look, I mean, when you are so divided, the only way out is a dialogue. Nobody's going to win here. Nobody's going to win in this, in this, in this, in this situation. And if somebody won, the other one would lose, and that would create this, would perpetuate the situation in society for several years. I have been, I've been very, very careful to, when you, using the case of my country, of Chile, because some people say I'm comparing, I'm not comparing, I'm just, said, I'm just saying, uh, we had more or less similar situations in Chile in 1973, and there was violence in the streets on both sides. On both sides, there was violence in the streets. And the opposition mobilized very strongly. And the government mobilized very heavily. And finally, this ended in a, in a breakdown. And let me say, say it as carefully as possible, because I, not because I don't, I, don't, I don't have an opinion on what happened, but because I, want to go to, to, I don't want to push the comparison too far. Too, 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 too far. But that was, that, that's, there are some clear things. Somebody won. And there were 17 years of dictatorship in Chile. And I wouldn't like that to happen. That's very simple. I don't want that to happen. And I don't think that anybody should want that to happen, whether his sides win or his sides loses. And the only way to avoid that is what happened in Chile late, at, at, at the last minute, very insufficiently, and failed completely, which was a dialogue between the government and the opposition led by the cardinal, by the way, of the, of the country at that time. But the polarization was too large. I mean, the, 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 extreme, uh, the, the extre extreme or ex the, the, the extremes on the two sides had their, uh, already a, 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 the upper hand. And they created a situation in which finally violence came, I mean, violence came to be the solution or the way out, not the solution, the way out of the problem. The, the consequence was 17 years of, 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 of dictatorship. So that's the choice, and I think it's a big choice. You have a dialogue, or you'll have, you eventually have some, a lot of violence because of what I said before, the problems are there. They're not going to go away. The problems have to be solved. And they will be solved by dialogue, consensus, or force. But they have to be solved at some point. And a lot of people are looking like they want the violence. I don't think that that's a good thing. I think that we have to have a dialogue and I have said, and we will talk about the, the, what dialogue that should be, but I want to be very brief on this. We have to have a dialogue, and the international community can be helpful for that. I think the international community can be helpful. And I'm not talking about the OES. I have even told him, I look, I don't mind who is there. But have somebody whom both can, can trust. I mean, the only reason why I think that there should somebody from the international community probably should be called in, whether it's the... the Secretary of the, the Vatican Secretary of State, who Secretary of State, who just at, until recently was the nuncio, the papal nuncio in Caracas until a few months ago, or somebody, is that there, there are no internal personalities that could do the job. I mean, that's the only reason. Well, nobody trusts anybody. If somebody finds three Venezuelans that can call everybody and everybody will go and feel that he is being respected, well, fine. I, that's, I mean, the whole, that would be ideal. If, that, if not, I think that the international community would help, but it will not help, it will not, the international community will not help taking sides. I understand groups in society can take sides. I understand groups in society can, uh, but of course, 
strongly make strong appeals for, 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 for change, etc. But I don't think that any kind of intervention from abroad will be legitimate. I don't think, and this is where the disagreements begin, I don't think there has been a clear, ma massive uh, uh, destruction of democracy in, in Venezuela. Of course, there are some problems which I don't like about the functioning of Venezuelan democracy, for example, the lack of independence of the judiciary, which is really a problem, really a problem. Problems of freedom of expression, even though some people do have, have, have ways of expressing their opinion. But I don't think that we, can, that we can legitimize any kind of movement against the government of Venezuela, who was, which was elected eight months ago, or nine, no, ten months ago. The president of Venezuela was elected by a majority several months ago, and not, not, not many people really in Venezuela proclaimed that this was a, 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 a phony election. And I don't think that has changed. So there has absolutely no reason to apply any of the instruments of the OES in the breakdown of democracy part, which are Article uh, 20 and 21 of the Inter-American Democratic Charter. All right, I think I'm, I think I'm quoting you right. Of course, there could be a possibility, and that's not an intervention, to send fact-finding missions according to the Inter-American Democratic Charter. But by the way, first, nobody had requested that. And second, whether it is the initiative of the government, that's Article 17, or the initiative of another country, which, or, or the Secretary General, or excuse me, the Council of the Secretary General, which would be Article 18, it still requires the consent of the government of Venezuela. So I mean, the problem is that, I mean, of course, uh, if you say you should bring it to council, yes, I can bring it to council. It's going to be in council tomorrow, not the Democratic Charter, because, by the way, Panama did not ask to apply the Democratic Charter. Panama only asked for a meeting, which any country has a chance, has a possibility to ask for a consultation minister, minister of meetings on the situation in Venezuela, not according to the charter. But if you are to use the charter, those are the ways of using the charter. You only use the charter, Article 18, Article 17, when the government of the country requests it. And uh, chapter, eight, uh, chapter 18, when, uh, Article 18, when the council or the secretary general uh, uh, take the initiative with the consent of the country. Article 20, 21 and 22, excuse me, from Article 20, 20, 20 and 21, when there's a breakdown of democracy in the country. It already happened. So the council, the council decides to go, go ahead, and the council has to agree that it happened, and that it, can, it will go ahead with the mission not to intervene, but to try to restore, to try to discuss dialogue, etc., in the country to try to restore democracy. So we're very far from that. We're not going to do that. And I think that therefore that what we should be doing is all together, continue pushing to dialogue, for dialogue in Venezuela. If there is an agreement by the government of Venezuela for me to send a mission, I will send it. Of course I will. But if not, let anyone in the international community who is able to do that try to organize a real dialogue. I think that the dialogue that began the other day, by the way, is an incomplete dialogue, of course. It's an incomplete dialogue because some people, the, the business sector of especially, are, 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 are there. It's an important thing because probably they have to do the, they are the, they are the, the, the best qualified to, have the, to, to work on the matters of uh, solving the economic crisis. But it's incomplete because the opposition has participated, not participating. So I think that the previous thing that should be done is sit down with the opposition and see in which terms are they willing to sit at the table. Well, some of them will say, only if Maduro leaves, if he does this and he does that, etc. Probably, but I think that there are people in the opposition who want some kind of a dialogue and they should be given the conditions in which they can do it. I mean, that's about everything I'm going to say in the, to get started. And I hope that we have a lively dialogue on this matter. Thank you very much.
as we move into the living room portion mm -hmm. okay. of the discussion. Um, oh, just, so, sorry. Um, I mean, I mean, I'll just, I'll just go right into it. I think a lot of people are going to have questions. So, when you talk about intervention in or not intervening, and you've said these things in the press, and you said it now about the OAS not intervening, does that rule out um, the OAS playing a role to sort of uh, usher in a type of discussion? Would that mean that the OAS could play uh, a role in bringing the two sides together to have that dialogue that's necessary? No, of course, I, I think that. I mean, that's, that's possible under the Inter-American Democratic Charter. We can uh, set the mission and try to start a dialogue among the parties. That does not mean that we accept any, in, in, that in that dialogue, we do absolutely anything to try to change the, I mean, no regime change would be a good, I mean, the, the, the OAS is not involved in regime change, in any case. Regime change is not, it's a no-no for the OAS, except, except, of course, when, the, when the, all, all, the, all the member countries qualify the regime as illegitimate. Mm -hmm. But this is, I mean, I haven't heard anybody in the, in the council or in the, the, in, in, even in the, around the council Talk, even start qualifying Venezuela's government as an as a illegitimate, illegitimate regime, which several members of civil society do, of course, but in the OAS, no. So I would say that intervention against the, uh, uh, intervention in the terms of uh, getting involved in discussions for regime change in a country, in a democratically elected government in the Americas is something we don't do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, but that leaves a lot of other issues. I mean, that leaves issues like freedom of political prisoners, that leaves issues like disarming the colectivos, these armed uh, urban gangs that a lot of people feel uh, operate with the tacit support of the government. Uh, is, is the role of the OAS also one that could include verification of an agreement that came about between the government and the opposition? Well, all those are issues that should be agreed on a dialogue in the, inside the country between the government and the opposition. And if they agree on that and agree on the OAS verifying them, of course, we are, I mean, we are always, we are even verifying, verifying the, 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 the violence of among armed gangs in El Salvador to make sure that it sticks. Because we very much believe that we have to stop death. I mean, and lower the, the rate of crime. Of course, if there's some agreement in, in a country and they call in the OAS to, to verify that agreement, we, we go. We, we, well, we have done it in Colombia for the past eight years. Um, before I open it up to the rest, I just have two, two more questions. Um, you talk about the issues of breakdown of democracy, and, and this is the hard one because then it goes, you know, for some people the breakdown of democracy means these three things, for other people it means these other things. Um, but I guess the bottom line is that there has been, um, there, there's questionable commitment at least with a certain group of Venezuelans on uh, the, the the framework right now that exists, the political framework, if it is permitting of dissent, and if dissenting opinions actually can play a role in Venezuela as equal partners. Uh, and you know, you know this better than anybody. You've seen how the treatment of, of dissenting voices in the Venezuelan parliament or Congress, how that's worked out for years. Um, you've seen that they're really not dominant or, or equal partners in these discussions. How, how would you approach the issue uh, as complex as it is, given that the two sides have different perceptions of what democracy seems to be or the role of different actors in democracy? I mean, it seems like there's a real need for mediation here. And um, I'm just trying to get your sense of what what you believe would be necessary to deal with this, that being the OAS or an independent organization. I mean, what, what do you see the way forward here? Well, I think that this is a, a difficult question. Sure. Let, let, me, let me put it as, a, as I see it, um, in, I, 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 as I have seen it in, in, the, in, the, in the OAS and before that. Uh, actually, when the Inter-American Democratic Charter was discussed, uh, 
uh, really among within the heads of state uh, in uh, in 2001 in the the, the, the the third summit of the Americas in Quebec City, Canada. Uh, you can find the speeches or things said that show that the the gen that some some of the leaders tended to view, uh, as I see it, by the way, uh, breakdown of democracy, not just as the overthrow of the democratically elected government, <laughs> which at least I, I think is something that we should we should accept as a minimal definition. You know, for example, that in the in the case of the Ibero-American summit and the, in the, in the, in the not the Iberian American Summit, because the Iberian American Summit I stick very much by the agreements of 1996. But the democratic clauses of the Mercosur or the UNASUR seem to apply to every government. I mean, every, anybody who overthrows the government is acting un undemocratically, even if the government is not democratic, which I don't think is, is fair. No, so I'm saying, I think that several heads agreed that there were, aside from deposing the democratic government, there were other major breaks of breakdowns of democracy. So much so that our first uh, conference, our first uh, uh, very series of conference called the, um, the, the, the Cátedra de las Américas, the Chair of the Americas, uh, President Carter uh, enumerated about, uh, I don't know, there were more than 10, there must have been 13 or 18 or something like that, different ways in which democracy could be seriously violated without overthrowing the government. <laughs> I would, I, when, I, when I spoke to, to, to the, on the matter with the council in 2007, I did mention a few of those. I said, for example, a massive, I don't know, but one thing that's impossible, the word, the word. Uh, all these heads in, in Quebec, however, when they ever mentioned the possibility of other causes, they used the word massive in every case, mm -hmm. which is very important. I mean, they closed down or one of one newspaper even though you may feel that it's a break, it's a great breakdown of democratic rules, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it's not a massive suppression of, of, of media. <laughs> so therefore, it doesn't fall into the into the I mean, into the ideal category. Mm -hmm. I, that's why I used in in, 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 in in my presentation of 2007 and 2010 uh, the word massive in all those. I mean, massive violation of fraud. A, 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 a complete uh, elim elimination of one of the powers of the state, uh, uh, and there was there was there was there was a, a, another one who was, ah massive suppression of the of, of all the media of all the independent media. Some have changed. We have discussed the matter, but the, the council rejected that. That did not pass as a the, the country said look. What we're going to do is every time you have the feeling that something is wrong, you bring it to us and we'll decide if it's a, a matter of, a, of how the, the organization acting or not. And in the case of Venezuela, of course, uh, I, I, must, I, must, I, must, I must repeat, we haven't had, let me tell you, no, I, I, it wouldn't be fair to say we haven't had. Mm -hmm. in, 19, in, in 2007, mm -hmm. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice asked, asked me, and I did, to request the Venezuelan government for a uh, for a, a, a mission to examine the situation of Radio Caracas Television. I, re I requested the Venezuelan government, as she had asked me, so I took it. I took it upon myself to do it uh, as, as my initiative, and they said, "No, you can come wherever you want to Venezuela, but not for this case." So. There has never been an instance in which another, uh, some, some I would say, uh, uh, I mean the, 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 the interruption of a, of a, of a, 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 a media, a, a newspaper, a radio, or the intervention of the television channel, or some specific violation of human rights has been, and of course, I, I, I forgot to say massive violation of human rights is also a, 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 a cause which I proposed to council in, in 2007. So the fact is that the tools for the OAS to act, unless the crisis is really severe, mm -hmm. even if you extend the, the causes more beyond the elections, unless the crisis is really severe and there's lack of governability in the, in the country, I think they are very low. We can protest, 
we can call upon them, we can discuss it, mm -hmm. but there has not been a, 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 any decision since 2001 that would provide for any kind of action by the OAS unless it is a breakdown of, of the of the, of the, of the so, that, so that leads me to the question. So what can come out of this meeting on Thursday? Oh, I will tell you what, what I mean, the most that can come, the, the, I mean, the three things would happen. Nothing, because some countries want to do nothing. In fact, some of the other countries want to do nothing. I mean. No, well, I mean, let, we are, we are, I don't know how this is. Uh, uh, but I mean, some countries have actually accepted the idea that this should be dealt with by another organization. The strange thing is that CELAC issued a statement, uh, the Mercosur issued a statement, and all that. And when the OES wants to, be, to, to issue a statement, it says, no, the UNASUR has to do it. Well, that's not going to happen very soon, but. Uh, so, first, something, nothing could happen. Maybe it could happen that. Some countries say, no, we are not going to say anything. I mean, second, I don't think that there's going to be a, a, a call of a, uh, of a meeting of a foreign minister. Mm -hmm. But I do think that there could be some kind of a statement, more or less in the lines of the things I've said or other international organizations have said. Calling to a dialogue, condemning a violation of human rights, asking for an end of violence, and for guarantees for everybody participating in the panel. And offering, of course, our services to whatever. If, 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 the, if the, 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 the government of Venezuela, if, if they're different, I mean, look, we can always do it as, as, uh, as President Jose Mujica of Uruguay said, saying that he was willing to mediate mm -hmm. if both parties decided to, to, ask, to, to, to accept him as a mediator. So I think that's the most that will come from this. The I mean, maybe, maybe somebody will propose a mission mm -hmm. under Article 18. This is, should be 18. But then again, the government of Venezuela has to accept that mission. It's not that they can go just in a, They can only go without the acceptance of the government under Article 20 when they, when they believe that the government is not a democratic government anymore because it has been changed. Mm -hmm. Let me open it up for some questions, if there are any questions. <laughs> let, me, let me start there here are, in front, and then we're going to go in the back. Why don't we, here you go. Um, hi, thank you. Uh, I'm Lucia Leal with FNU Services. I wanted to um, clarify uh, if I understand that in the meeting tomorrow, uh, some actors may call for a mission, but I wanted to know if you think that a mission would be helpful by the OAS, uh, even if you feel that the tools of the OAS to act are limited. And also you talked about the possibility that the uh, Commission, Inter-American Commission of Human Rights may examine the human rights violations or the detentions. I wanted to know uh, a little bit more about that, uh, what can be done in that sense. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, como, como se dice en inglés, medida cautelar es cautionary measures. Precautionary measures, okay, thank you. Uh, the, what, what I, what I, I mean, the, I, I, was, I, I think that a, a mission would be helpful if both sides agree to it. I mean, there's no point in having a mission that, uh, uh, that's rejected by the government or rejected by the opposition, by the way. I mean, a mission rejected by the opposition doesn't make really much sense. Mm -hmm. There's no point in, in trying to do that. Or at least, I, was, I, will, I would not even say, let me just say it in, I mean, when I, want, when I went to, uh, to Nicaragua immediately after, ta after, after taking over as Secretary General of the OES, uh, I was... Uh, uh, I was called in by the government because the, 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 con the Congress wanted to depose the government. Mm. Of course, the opposition, led by now by President Ortega, he was the opposition leader at that time, and the Congress rejected this attempt to intervene, but they accepted to talk. They were willing to talk. We had conversations. With them. That would be the limit. I mean, a mission that has some expectation that will that he will be able to talk to all the actors uh, that's that's the, that's 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 the, uh, that, uh, certainly 
we can propose that. I'm not really sure it will be accepted, but certainly, we, if the police think that right, we can propose, I'm willing to send the missions wherever, wherever they, they, they serve that purpose. I would never send the mission uh, requested only, only by one side, or accepted only by one side, at least to talk. Now, yes, the Commission on Human Rights can act uh, in cases of, uh, of violation of human rights, Generally, cases the, 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 the commission views matters after the internal uh, the internal uh, resources uh, legal resources have been uh, depleted when when there has been a sentence by a court, etc. But in cases of uh, urgent matters, they can they dictate uh, 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 precautionary measures that countries can accept or not. That's a fact. I mean, they can accept them or not. But uh, I would say that that's one thing that was clarified in the in last year's uh, re reform of the of the Commission on Human Rights. Because our countries did accept, finally accepted in the report that there was a possibility of a, uh, of of, of, the, of dictating precautionary measures uh, in favor of uh, potential victims, when they are, especially when there is no uh, no certain. I mean, when when their life the freedom, or, I mean, there are, when there are permanent co uh, consequences that can take, that can be avoided with only with, uh, with precautionary measures. That's the discussion, by the way, for example, today in the, in the matter of the major of, of, of Bogota. To, to what extent his, uh, I mean, was his, his has for precautionary measures. So the commission is still discussing if this is, uh, if the deposing of the major is a, Permanent damage or not a permanent damage? In which case, it would wait for the for the for the final decision of the courts. But, in, but here's a question, and a lot of folks I think would would want to understand a little bit better. So, your powers are limited by the will of the members of the organization. Are there certain things that you can do on your own initiative? Well, I can. Uh, I mean. <laughs> As I say, in a hypothetical case, I can send the mission with the only the consent of the government. Mm -hmm. I don't have to ask the government, to, the, 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 the council, to approve a mission. If, if the government says that, I can, it says the, the secretary or the council can send the mission with the approval of the government. So okay. we, can, we, can, we, can, we can do that. We can do that. Alguien tiene la carta democrática. That's Article 18, I think. Well, the Secretary General or the Permanent Council may, with prior consent of the government concerned, arrange for visits or other actions in order to analyze the situation. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, theoretically, I could do it without the consent of the Council because this is alternative. I can right. do it. Huh? Right. But I, I think that it's easier to get. I don't think I, I would get it anywhere, but it's easier to get it from the council than to get it from the government of Venezuela right. at this moment. Believe me, I have asked, I've spoken the matter with mm -hmm. them, and they have said the same the thing that they always said. You are willing, you are perfectly, uh, you are invited to come to Venezuela whenever you want, but uh, not in times, not in these times of crisis. That's, uh, that's, uh, and that's happened recently, or I mean? Oh, yesterday. Okay. Yeah, yesterday. Okay. Let me keep on getting questions here. Microphone, please. Good morning. Um, Luis Alonso, ADAP. Uh, many thanks for doing this. Mr. Secretary, um, I think one of the few areas where both the opposition and the government in Venezuela agrees on is that they don't trust the OAS for different reasons. Each side has very strong objections to OAS uh, getting involved in trying to mediate uh, as a qualified or trusted mediator. If uh, the scenario where tomorrow nothing happens in tomorrow's meeting takes place, do you think this will have uh, an imp a negative impact on the organization reputation as a figure of uh, international, you know, hemispheric? Especially if Venezuela, uh, re, you know, it seems like they'll be able to take the matter into the UNASUR 
they were talking uh, about holding a UNASUR meeting in Chile uh, next week. So what will be the impact for the organization if that that's what happened? Thank you. Well, I, I believe very, very, I, I very much believe first that, uh, well, I, by the way, I had written in my, in the things in which there is agreement, I was going to, was going to say that, that uh, everybody agrees that in Venezuela, except some very, very few people, that they should not trust the OES. The opposition, because they feel they, they have called me Chavista many times. And the government, because as you know, I, was a, I, I, I wasn't the second leader of the, of the, of the, of the uh, I wasn't the first, I was the second. Mm -hmm. Alan Garcia is the, got the first insult from President Chavez. After that came several other presidents from the, from the region, there were about six or seven. I mean, so so I, I, it's really very hard to, to uh, I, 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 would, I would suggest that it's very hard to prove the hypothesis that I am at the service of the Venezuelan government when I have not been allowed to Venezuela since 1997, except for the funeral of President Chavez, except for the funeral of President Chavez. And whenever I have tried to go in times of normalcy, there has always been some problem that has not made it possible. The meeting to which I was going was suspended. Uh, they feel that probably it's a very low level meeting for the Secretary General to attend, etc. So the first thing I should I would say to, to, to one side is look, I haven't been to Venezuela since 2007 because the government, has, except with the, for the funeral of President Chavez, because not because I haven't wanted to go, but because I have not been accepted, admitted into the country or uh, invited to the country. The Secretary General who so hope to be invited to the country, not just to be admitted. As for the opposition, well, this is the only place where they can come to talk. I mean, I don't see, I have never seen anybody of the opposition around the UNASUR, the CELAC, the MERCOSUR, or whatever. So at least they can, have, they can go to the, to the meetings of the OES and the meetings of the civil society, and as you know, a couple of years, last year, a couple of, look, last year, we had a quite a, quite a, a, an incident in the, in the meeting with the civil society between the Venezuelan ambassador and the, and the, but that's as far as we could go, the opposition, but that's as far as we're gonna go, because let us, look, I think that the, my, 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 the, 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 the I remember there was one day, once, once a, a, an editorial in the, I think it was in the Universal, or some of the opposition Venezuelan newspapers, saying, by, by, by the way, quoting somebody from the students, he said the, the Secretary General has to choose. He will represent the government or he will represent the people of the Americas. And I said, I, have to, I represent the government because this is an organization of American states. This is the organization of American states. It's not the organization of the American people. And of course, we are assuming that if governments are democratic, they represent the people. But my, 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 my capacity to act is limited by the will of the governments that form the organization. That's a part of the rules of the game. There are no supranational organizations. No supranational organizations. In that sense. There are supranational organizations in the sense that some rule over others. The Security Council of the UN is the one that comes, always comes to mind. The OES has to do exactly as, president, as, a, as a former Secretary General and President of Colombia, Alberto Lleras Camargo, said. The OES will be or will do what its member countries want it to be or to do. Does that always mean consensus, though? No, not necessarily. We've had votes. We've had votes. For example, I remember in the case of, uh, of, uh, of uh, a problem between Costa Rica and, uh, and, uh, and Nicaragua on the matters of border matters, and uh, there was a resolution approved by, 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 by vote. And they can, they can, they could be, I mean, they, I mean, the countries usually tend to avoid the vote, but they have reached moments in which 
the, 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 the vote has been taken, or at least some countries have not taken, have, have said that they have no objection, but they don't vote. Example in there. In the, in the Assembly on, on Human Rights, mm -hmm. the Assembly of Human Rights, it was clear that four countries were not willing to vote on the solution. Mm -hmm. So, but they finally accepted the resolution that existed because they didn't want to appear as a, as a, as a, um, as, 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 minor, as a minority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So many countries, many times, it, it's expressed in a consensus, but not really consensual in the mm -hmm. sense that not everybody agrees. But there have been votes. Mm -hmm. There have been votes, several votes. I remember, by the way, the UNASUR has not been able to choose its secretary general for about a year right. because they don't have a consensus on the name. The OAS votes on the election of the Secretary General and who gets one, one more vote than the other one gets elected. So, no, it's not. The consensus is a, 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 a desire of every country, but there are rules for voting, and we have taken votes. Let me get the uh, chair in the middle there with the microphone. Yes, Duke Banks, I'm a concerned Venezuelan American. Two points on your presentation, Mr. Secretary on the validity of the election last year. It was very close. The difference was, I think, less than 1% or 1.5%. One Maduro promised that the results would be audited. The audit never has come. So I think a lot of Venezuelans still really wonder the validity of that election. Number two was your predecessor, Cesar Gavira, practically lived in Caracas you know, for a while. And there was dialogue at that time, but after that eff effort, there was a lot of agreements that the Chavista government really never, you know, honored. Which is only, I think, causing that a lot of the opposition is very skeptical about the dialogue and who should be the mediator. Okay. Um, just, just two observations. Mm -hmm. But from that also, there have been editorials from various places, from El País in España, or in Spain, not to mention, you know, the Washington Post here, and a lot of, that there has to be more of a sense that the Latin American countries need to actually get their act together and address the lack of democracy, democracy that's going on in Venezuela. And essentially, so I guess the question is, what leadership can be expected under your circumstances, which is very limited, as you've mentioned, but to show, you know, what can be done to essentially prompt the Latin American countries to basically recognize that a democracy is a lot more than just having an election. Mm -hmm. So let me just, let me just add to, to, his, to his question. Um, so, so you see other bodies, for instance, um, in the United States Congress, for instance, you're, you're familiar with things like uh, resolutions expressing mm -hmm. the viewpoints of, uh, of, the, of, a, of the Senate or of the Congress on a bunch of different issues. Do you find the use, and this I guess it goes a little bit with what Stu's question was as well, but showing or relaying what your views are on a particular situation it carries a lot of weight because of who you are and who you represent. Do you find that to be useful? The issue, and I would just focus on the issues of human rights, the issues of the press, the issues of dissent, uh, and the issues of, of uh, you know, political prisoners in, in, in Venezuela. Do you find the use in, in, in showing your views on those issues, or do you believe that that, uh, is it useful or is it not useful? No, I think it's useful. I've made two statements of Venezuela calling to a dialogue. Okay. And I very much, uh, without any f false modesty, I would say that I think that they have been very useful. <laughs> I mean, several other people say, let's have a li but uh, 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 let's have, I mean, the only choice for Venezuela is the dialogue. <laughs> and that, I think I was the first one to say it, if I'm not wrong, the first one. Now, on the mother, on the, so, so I think it's very useful, and I don't, do not disregard other, other, I spoke about human rights in one of those, uh, Pronouncements, and maybe we'll have to talk about them again. But uh, if you ask me, if you can, if I can do, uh, I mean, lead as some people. I don't believe in, in individual and empty leaderships. When I went to, when the time I went to Nicaragua, 
I will just call about that, and I learned it by well. Uh, they didn't want to, the, the Congress and the President didn't want me to go, and I mean, the, the, the head of the opposition didn't want me to go. Because the foreign minister of Nicaragua had arrived back home saying the Secretary General of the OAS is going to come to put order in Nicaragua. Nobody wanted to talk to me. I mean, that's not the point. If you want to, if you go to a country it's because you feel, and I, I, I imagine Cesar Gaviria felt that, maybe it was, maybe, maybe the, the events proved him wrong, but he felt that he could really mediate meaningfully among the two sides, and the two sides were willing to talk to him. Now, I don't think that it's possible to, 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 do, to do any, to any kind of leadership if the countries don't want it. I mean, the big, the big difference between the UNASUR and the OAS is the United States. I mean, the other side is CELAC. CELAC, by the way, issued a very general, general decision. But the only said between CELAC, excuse me, between CELAC and the United States and the, and the OAS is the United States and Canada. So why don't the other, the, 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 if, if the OAS is not able to make a, to make a statement, on the matter, or to act on the matter, where else are you going to go? Where else are you going to go? I mean, the countries are not, I mean, I think that there's one thing that you have to, I mean, it's difficult here in the U.S. to, uh, and I'm not saying because of anything wrong in the U.S., just because you're not there. I, I went to the CELAC meeting in Cuba. Of course, if you take the debate, the general debate, and the things that President said, and you read the, 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 the words, they have a lot of differences, enormous amount of differences. But the climate was a get-together climate. They wanted to stick together. That's the reality we have today. So unless you are able to, com to convince them that something collective must be done, they will not do it. I mean, why is everybody talking about dialogue today in Venezuela? Because there's an opposition. I mean, two months ago, three months ago, almost nobody believed that there was an opposition. A real opposition, I mean, a strong opposition. Of course, it was important politically. He had won elections, etc. But an opposition capable to mobilize in the way it has mobilized was not there. So the attitude of the international community will never be one of acting unless they feel that there is a crisis in the country, a real crisis. This crisis they are trying to, in the, for this crisis they are trying to promote a, a dialogue because they believe that the two actors are, I would say, more or less uh, equal in the matters of weight. And therefore a dialogue must take place. By the way, just a clarification, uh, we were not called to observe the elections in Venezuela. So what we use, but what we usually do as an organization is uh, respect the institutions and take what the, country, what, the, what the institutions in charge of elections do. When there was a situation in Mexico seven years ago with, with the election of President Calderon, in which the separation in numbers was very small, we had not observed the election, and we said we are going to respect what the, what the, what the, what the Mexican electoral tribunal says. We have to apply the same rule always. And that's what we did. I know, I know, I know, no, no. I'm, I was going to say that. I mean, I was going to say that. I think that the problem was that uh, nobody in Venezuela, nobody really, was prepared for such a, such a narrow uh, election. I, I think that the opposition would have celebrated even if they had four or five points difference because they came for a, from, from a difference of 10 points against President Chavez. They were not well prepared for that, so they spent a lot of time discussing matters of procedure and what they would do, etc. I think that, uh, that certainly that, 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 that's true. I mean, all the strength should have been uh, made on the, on the idea that, uh, that President Maduro had to have a dialogue with the opposition. Uh, before I get to the last question, I just want to follow up given, given this discussion. Uh, you know, elements of the opposition feel that this, if this is not dealt with, it could lead to some sort of 
uh, civil war type of situation or confrontation. People in the government don't feel that it's that. How do you characterize what's happening in, in Venezuela? No, I think there's a, I mean, and let me say something which is very, with Latin America, that you and me understand very well. I mean, this is carnival season, and there were even mobilizations in the, I mean, big, big rallies in, in Caracas. I mean, not everybody, several people went to, the, went, to, went, to, to, went, to, went to vacation. But if you are able to, to mount those rallies in the middle of the carnival, you are really doing something special. I think that they were made precisely to show that this was, that they, they meant this seriously and that the mobilization will continue. I think they will continue. And if not, if, and as I said before, I mean, I think that breakdowns take place. I saw it in my country, I mean, I mean that I, so, but that, that memory comes very much, uh, much to mind. If you don't deal with the basic issues that are dividing the society, you can have that, pro that, that problem forever. Get a microphone over. Here, this is the last question that we're going to take. Yes, uh, I am uh, Jorge Vian, Spanish ambassador to the OAS. I just want to address again the issue of uh, UNASUR and MERCOSUR. Um, you know that uh, the issue, I mean, the, the crisis in Venezuela has been discussed there. Um, uh, by Mercosur has been discussed also at UNASUR. Uh, I think that uh, at the OAS uh, we had a very brief discussion from almost two weeks ago, uh, not uh, as a topic of the agenda, but, as a, but in the last set point uh, in Asuntos Bari and so I think it's good for the OAS to have this discussion. Uh, don't you think, uh, Secretary General, that it was a dangerous precedent? I mean, not to discuss uh, the crisis at the OAS and uh, when, when, when uh, it has been treated in the other fora, uh, maybe uh, you know, a future crisis uh, could be, I mean, could have the same result and people say, you know, let's, let's uh, bring, uh, let's take the issue uh, to UNASUR. Uh, and uh, then you talk about uh, the meeting uh, tomorrow. Um, you said, I mean, you talk about the possibilities, but what is your personal opinion? I mean, not about what's going to happen, but what would you like to happen? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I really, I, I, like I said, that it's, uh, I mean, that when a country, I mean, when a country asks for a, for a meeting of ministers to treat with some, with some issue, he asks for that to the permanent council. And Panama did that more than a week ago. More than a week ago. I mean, it, this says, it, it doesn't say anywhere in the rules that he has to address the secretary general or the, or the president. No, it says the permanent council. So the obvious thing to do, and what has always been done, is that the president of the council calls the council into session to discuss the matter. That happened on uh, uh, the middle of last week. Today is Wednesday or on Wednesday. We called the, uh, the council to, uh, to, to, uh, to a session on, for Thursday. But the president was out of the country at that time. He, he did it on the phone. And the vice president, who is the ambassador of Venezuela, said that this was illegal because he was the one that was supposed to call the meeting. And he did not call the meeting. And that he would start a lot of consultations on the matter. Well, the consultations lasted until yesterday morning, in which the president came back to, 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 to Washington and immediately called a meeting of the council. He was going to call it for Wednesday, but they, we was made to know that today was the anniversary of, uh, of the death of President Chavez, so probably it wasn't a good idea. So he called it for Thursday. Now, I, I mean, I can tell you all the, all the, the things that happened, but it had never happened that the council was not allowed to answer the request of an ambassador 
to the from, to the calling of a of a, uh, a a meeting of a consultation meeting of ministers. While the others well, all issued their statements, of course the others don't need to issue their statements. They the president consults them on the on the strength that they want to so they negotiate by phone. So it was easier. The only the only permanent functioning body of the of the of the, of the Americas is the is the, the council the permanent council organization of American state. But I think it was, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shame that it has not met. It should have met already. And if, when it meets, it should be a proper meeting. It shouldn't be a private meeting or a secret meeting or nothing like that. It should be a proper meeting. If there's concern that there will be some kind of disorder in the room, if, if it's, I, I will be willing to accommodate for that. That's, I understand that problem. But I think that, I mean, that, uh, by the way, I think that this is worse for, I mean, the, the delay. It's not a good bargain. And we had talked about the matter a week ago, the language would have probably been less uh, concerned. I mean, the, the, what has been said all over the world about this wouldn't have happened. As I, told, as I told the ambassador of Venezuela, we had had this meeting two weeks ago or 10 days ago, it would have been much, much more convenient for you. But for some reason, they decided to try to delay it, and they delayed it, and that, that's, that's, that has created the consequences that created. And, and just to push on the second question that you had, which, what would you like to see happen tomorrow? Well, you already said it. Well, I, well, what I would like to see happen is just a clear statement on the, from, the, from, the, from the council supporting the notion of dialogue and the, of meaningful dialogue in conditions of uh, respect for human rights and the state of law and the, the rule of law. And uh, the, 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 the call, calling for for the for an end of violence and an investigation on the violations of human rights that occurred. That would that would be at least what I would like to have to happen. Mm -hmm. Of course, but and, and I am open if they want to uh, to, to to ask for a mission to the to, to, they, I, I would I will be open to that. But I'm not going to promote it myself because I already did and it didn't, it didn't work. Well, I, I just want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank you especially because you got a lot on your plate and you took the time to do this and uh, that means a lot. Uh, we continue trying to bring awareness uh, and understanding to these issues. I hope we've done a, uh, a, uh, a good job of doing that here today. Uh, once again, thank all of you, to people watching, to people here. We look forward to seeing you the next time. Thank you. And I want to thank Carlos because he, he <laughs> Uh, we, we, this is, as I said before, we set this, uh, this appointment three times until right. it finally works. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great.